On a recent episode of Craving Answers, Craving God, we explored the topic of depression and isolation. We endeavored to offer advice on how to climb out of that deep, dark valley. For some people who are depressed and lonely, the condition can lead to an unhappy view of oneself. How's your self-image? For a Christian, is a high level of self-esteem part of a healthy Christian perspective? Is it possible to learn to love yourself? And if it is, is that God-pleasing? Let's talk about it today on Craving Answers, Craving God. I'm Chuck Rathert with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. Aaron, is it your intention today to help people learn to love themselves? Yes, I, I hope we do. I, it's a, it's a, people don't have, in general, in our culture now, people tend to have alternately a too high view of themselves and a too low view of themselves. But we, we don't think about ourselves in an appropriate way. We think we're, we're too prideful, we're too self-centered, we're too arrogant, we're too convinced that we're right. And at the same time, we go home at night and lay down and we hate ourselves for it. And we think that we're failures, um, we think that we're not worthy of love, all these sorts of things. So what I'd like us to do today is to help people learn to love themselves in an appropriate biblical way. I, I do think it's a problem that that, that we don't love ourselves in an appropriate biblical way. And I'd like for us to be able to do that. Okay. So this sounds like kind of a steep mountain to climb here. Let's just dive into some scriptures. In Leviticus 19, Moses writes, quote, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then this command is repeated eight times in various books of the New Testament. So to me, this seems to imply that I already know that I love myself and that I should bring love of neighbor up to that same level. Is that what it means? I think that's probably reading too much. And I, I don't think Moses, and then you know, Jesus quotes this famously, he quotes this t- th- passage. I don't think that they're saying, you already love yourself, and now bring the love of your neighbor up to that. I think that what he's saying is, we should love our neighbors like they're us. We should love our neighbors like we want to be loved. I do think this is a super important text because I think that one of the things that we do in our culture is we, we, we contrast, well, I'll I'll say it this way. And this is one of the reasons why I'm glad we're talking about this. I recently saw one of my friends, this is super common too. This isn't a newsflash. One of my friends on Facebook had posted uh, some, something along the lines of in everybody, every, all of our listeners, if you've been on social media, you've seen stuff like this before that I spent years worrying about. I, I spent years trying to make people love me, but when I grew up, I learned I just need to learn to love myself, that sort of thing. And so the contrast there is like, I mean, so w- w- the thought there is, is that I need to be loved. I need people to love me. And because they don't, I have to learn to love myself. But the way the Bible does it, though, is this, is that loving yourself is intricately connected to loving others. Do you want to love yourself? Loving your neighbor is where you learn what it means to love and value and find deep meaning in who you personally are. And this is what the Bible does. Now, this is counterintuitive in our culture because we just assume as postmoderns that I have to love myself. Nobody else is going to love me like I can love me. And so I have to love myself and not worry about others. But what the Bible insists is that we're really truly loving ourselves when we love outside of ourselves to other people. Then we will find ourselves being loved by others, but also by ourselves. We'll find our true selves in loving others. There's a really famous uh, passage, too, that, that is very similar to this. In Ephesians chapter five, where Paul is talking about husbands and wives, and he ba- he ba- the, the gist of the text is husbands should love their wives and give themselves up for their wives, like Jesus has given themselves up for his people. And it says, um, it, uh, Paul says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. It's very, 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 very parallel. Jesus and Moses say, "Love your neighbor as yourself." Paul says, "Love your wives as 
you love your bodies. In other words, love your wife like you love yourself. And he goes on to say this, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. So he says, you nourish and take care of your body like Christ takes care of the church because we are members of his body. So what Paul does is he says, loving yourself in a context of marriage is inextricably tied to your love for your spouse. You want to love yourself? You better love your spouse. Loving your spouse is like loving your own body and cherishing your own body and taking care of your own body. Okay, let's stop right there because we're at, a, I think, an important junction. And I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this, but this seems to be what we might call a law and gospel distinction, what you just said there. You want to love yourself, you better love your spouse. Now, that could mean that it's a quid pro quo. If you love your spouse, then because you loved your spouse, you will love yourself. Or it could be that if you become selfless and put your spouse first, you will experience spiritual dividends from that that are otherwise unattainable. Could or are those the same? Or I, I, I don't think that there's any difference there. I don't think there's any difference. If somebody so, I mean, whenever I say this, people are going to immediately say, and some of our listeners are, and rightly saying, "Well, that sounds like a recipe for getting abused." You're not taking care of yourself. You're just loving other people. You know, your spouse or your friends, the people you're trying to love, they could take advantage of that, and you could be, you know, you could be depleted. Like Jesus energy. when he was, who emptied himself? Yes. However, and I would say, I would say if you're in a relationship where you are faithfully loving your spouse and they are abusing you, you need to take steps to protect yourself. This is not, this is not a command to, to put yourself at risk. But in a Christian marriage or you know, in, in a broader sense, the way Jesus and Moses use it, and Paul actually here in Ephesians 5 uses it in this broader sense too. In a Christian community, in, in, in the family of God, loving other people should be reciprocated by them loving you too. And in that scenario, it's not a case of like, well, there's two things. There's loving other people so that they'll love me back. But then there's loving other people so that I'll like grow spiritually or psychologically. Those two things are the same thing. All, all we're saying here is, is that if any man wants to gain his life, he'll lose it. That's what Jesus says. The way to find yourself is to give yourself up to others. We to be were, selfless instead of selfish. Yes. To be selfless instead of selfish means that ultimately yourself will benefit. You will find yourself. And, and the reason why this is so hard, like this is the one of the, I'll just tell you the main reason why this is confusing for us is because we're Westerners, we're Americaners, uh, Americaners, we're Americans. We believe that our own selves are the main thing. And that, that, doesn't everybody believe that? No, I mean, that's it's not, not just Americans, is it? It's, I, I probably. I mean, so. isn't that the human condition? Maybe a little bit, but we as Americans have put it on steroids. That the, the, the value of the individual over and above community is like one of our primary creeds. And what the reality, though, is that I only make sense. I only Aaron Miller only makes sense in relationship. Who am I? If I ask the question, "Who am I?" The, the only answers I can give are, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son. I could say, uh, you want to say, I'm a worker. Yeah, but what does that mean? It means there are people that I serve. That's what it means. Or there's property that I tend to, or there's data that I'm working with. I only exist in relationship to this complex web of other human beings. Whether I'm a farmer planting crops for other people to eat or I'm an IT guy working with data for other people to use, especially in terms of my existence in a family or in a friend group or in a church community or in my golf club, I only actually, I don't make any sort of sense outside of human relationship. I, okay, so maybe, maybe sleeping in bed at night, you know, or 
uh, uh, you know, driving in my car, but I'm always sleeping so that I can wake up and be with other people. I'm always driving in my car so that I can be with other people or do things for other people. We've lost sight of this, and what Jesus and Moses too, like you've pointed out, are trying to point us to is that if you want to love yourself, you will love your neighbor. If you want to love yourself, you'll love your best friend, you'll love your spouse. That's where we find ourselves out. And the reason why we, as contemporary Westerns, hate hate ourselves is that we've cut ourselves off from this web of interpersonal relationships. And like Jesus warned us, if you want to hoard your life, you'll lose it. And that's what we've done. We've made ourselves the main characters in our movies, and now we don't have meaning or purpose, and we've actually trained ourselves to hate ourselves because of that. And what I would like to do today is for us to point ourselves back to what Jesus and Moses and Paul are telling us. Actually, if you lose your life to other people, you will learn to love yourself. Here's something else that uh, Paul tells us. He talks about loving self in his second letter to his protege, Timothy. He writes, quote, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, and it just goes on and on. There's there's much more. But at the beginning of this list, this multitude of characteristics of a depraved humanity is lovers of self, which he seems to have put his crosshairs on it as, here's your number one problem. Stop doing that. And here we are talking about loving ourselves. Yes. So do we have a problem? Uh, We do if we're like this. So there's two ways you can talk about loving yourself, right? Because there's the Jesus and Paul way, which is, and Moses way, which is love your neighbor as yourself. In that case, loving self is good because it's intricately connected to love of neighbor. Finding and knowing and appreciating who God created you to be in the context of human relationship is a good healthy love that we're lacking in our culture, but we all need. With Paul's warning here in Timothy, though, look at the kind of love he's talking about. So he says, people will be lovers of self. I'm just going to read your quote there uh, from the text, Chuck. Lovers of money, proud. What does that mean? That means uh, elevating yourself over against other people. Arrogant. What is that? Same thing. Being like abusive. I'm better than other people. Abusive harming other people to benefit yourself for whatever reason, disobedient to their parents, cutting off the relationship, the family relationship that God has given us. That this is just of, a laundry list of hating your neighbor. Yes, yeah. And as a result, it's going to be bad love, which leads to self-hatred. So that's the bad kind of love, love that denies human community, love that elevates self over human community. That's a horrible type of love, which which our society is great at. All of us are very good at this now, which is why we have this epidemic of self-hatred and identity crises. Instead, what we need to do is love ourselves in the true, genuine, biblical way, which is God and neighbor first. We exist for them, and by doing that, we'll find that we love ourselves. So as we have this conversation and we talk about the Jesus way of loving yourself and the selfish way of loving yourself— This all feels kind of abstract to me. It's very gray. Is this black and white to you as you think about and talk about this? Do you have more clarity than the average bear on this question, do you think? More clarity than the average bear. I don't know. Um, I I, I think I understand it. uh, Jesus is teaching me about this. I will tell you this, that I've lived my life for chunks of uh, my adult life. I've lived it away from Christ. I have loved myself in that text that you just read sort of sense, where I've elevated myself over my spouse and my kids. I cut myself off from church community. I cut my I cut myself off from my parents. I will tell you, I did not, and I'm very, very close with my parents, always have been. I, there was a space of a year and a half where I did not talk to my parents. I didn't see them. I avoided my parents That's and my dark siblings. valley we talked about in our opening. Yes. I, I, had, I had a friend, one of my best friends, lives in Boston. When I was at my bottom, when I had bottomed out, he flew in from Boston to try and encourage me and build me up. I refused to see him. Like he flew from Boston. I refused to talk to him. I loved myself more than them. I was so miserable. I was so lonely. I would cry myself to sleep at night. I hated myself. I did not want to give up my rebellion against God and my family and my friends because I was determined to do what I wanted to do. I have found, though, 
that in my relationship life, when I put my friends first, when I love my family first, kind of like actually, the Bible says you should do. Ex- yeah, this, and you, and you, but you want to make it black and white. I am way happier. I have found that in my sex life with my wife, when I serve her, when I put her first, I end up being more satisfied than if I put myself first. I have found with my kids that if I blow them off and insist that it's their job to fill in the emotional gaps of my life, that I end up feeling pretty lonely and disconnected with them. When I put them first and try to make try to make their needs and their desires and you know their schedule, when I try to make that my goal to serve them in their life, that I'm actually much happier in my relationship with them. I just think practically this is the way it's at. People feel disconnected from their families. I know for a fact that people feel disconnected from their spouses. People feel disconnected from their jobs. And it's all because they've 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 lined these things up to benefit themselves, to love themselves in that selfish sort of way. And what they've what they've done is they've lost them. They've lost a sense of purpose and mission and identity. And they've learned to dislike themselves, to hate themselves because of it. But when we put others first, when we live a life, a self-sacrifice, which is only possible, I think, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll find that we end up being happier, being more fulfilled, and learning to love ourselves. So in the 16th chapter of Matthew's gospel. uh, Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, if anyone would come after me, that is, become a follower of Jesus, become a Christian, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So are you saying that it is possible to love oneself while denying oneself? Yeah, actually, uh, and I just flipped over here as you're reading that. Um, what you need to do is you need to keep on. So Jesus says, deny yourself, follow me. But he goes on to say this, and I, and I, I referenced this a few minutes ago. Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. If you hoard your life, if you love yourself, if you try to make yourself first, you will lose your life. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So what he's saying is, you, you want to have a life? You want to be fulfilled? Do you want to love yourself? Deny yourself then, follow me. Make the worship of me the centerpiece of your existence, and you will find your life. It's counterintuitive. And this is why people don't like the claims of Christianity. People don't like the claims of Jesus when he claims to be the Lord of the universe because it feels like it takes away from it. It feels oppressive. It feels like I'm yeah, losing, because I want to be Lord I'm of losing the something. Yeah, I feel like I've lost something in that. But Jesus insists, if you lose yourself to me, you'll actually, at the end of the day, get yourself in real profound ways. And what we have is, we, it's, I mean, just look around. Like, I've, I've, I'm kind of repeating myself now. Just all we have to do is, like, look in the mirror or look around at the people around us. Everybody is living for themselves, and everybody is discontented and lonely. And Jesus says, if you'll just love me and follow me and give up your life to me, I'll let you have all of it. Let's talk about that for a second. You recounted, for those who are listening to us, that you went through a a deep valley, a dark period at one time where yeah. you were miserable. Yeah. I'm not overstating it, right? And now that's part of your past. Somebody listening to us today is saying, that is where I am right now. I don't love myself. I'm not happy with myself. And frankly, I sometimes entertain thoughts of self-harm. That's where I am. How did you get out of that deep, dark valley how can you explain that to somebody listening to us who's in it now to help them get out? Well, I, I, I grew sick of myself. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a bunch of different parts here. At, at, the, at, at the bottom of it is, is it's a God thing, is that Jesus rescued me. But my experience is an experience of growing sick of myself. Did you ever feel like it was never going to end? Oh, yeah. And in fact, I, I knew that it could end. I knew there were options. But I thought I've gone too far. There, there was a time when I didn't want it. There was a time when I willingly chose misery. So you see, there's a trade-off, and, and everybody's got to come to this point where they realize what's you know there's a pill they can take and a pill they must refuse, and the choice is which one to do it. And the two pills are submit to Jesus and self freedom, and you can only have one of those. 
And I knew that the self-freedom pill was killing me. I hated my life. It was miserable. But I thought, I can't give that up. I can't not be in charge. I can't let somebody else be in charge of me. And at, at one point, I just realized, I'm dying here. I'm losing my kids. I'm losing my. I'm going to lose my wife. I'm going to lose everything. And I can't do this anymore. I'm sick of being in charge. I'm sick of screwing everything up. And I, I took the Jesus pill. And again, I mean, that, that's a God thing. It's completely a, a Holy Spirit thing. But I, I would just say to people who are struggling with this sense of like, I just, I, I, I have to, I have to get my way. I have to be the most important person in the room. I just want to be happy, and I'm, I just need to learn to love myself. I would just tell these people, um, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for the sake of Jesus and the cross, you'll get it back. I would just say that's the trade off, and, and you just got to trust me. There are probably some people listening to us that who are not Christians or who maybe have some kind of Christian experience, but they're nominal Christians at best. Now they're listening to this. Maybe they're going through a, a deep valley. Maybe they're not. But they know people. Maybe they are people who love other people, who do kind things for other people. They're not doing it from a Christian motivation because they're not Christian. But the Apostle John, in chapter 4 of his first letter, states simply, we love, we Christians, mm -hmm. we love yeah. Because he first loved us. Does that change the game? Uh, well, uh, um, I mean, that's super important. I, it's, 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 it's the heart of w what it means to love. What it means to love and to even to love yourself, the heart of it is what this text is talking about. I, so I was thinking about this Facebook friend who posted that meme about, it wasn't a meme, it was just like a big block quote about, um, you know, I spent years hoping other people would love me, and then I just learned when I grew up that I'll be happy if I learn to love myself. I mean, so the problem with that though is is that so so a there's truth in it. Learning to rely on other people's love of me is a letdown. Nobody loves me as much as my mom, my wife. Those two women are the people who love me most in the entire world, and yet. They can't love me enough to make me completely happy. My mom has let me down before, many times. My, I was convinced she was trying to kill me when I was in junior high and high school. You know, <laughs> she's my mortal enemy. My parents were. Uh, Angela, she she's been through so much with me. I've put her through hell on wheels, and she's consistently loved me. And yet, her love can't satisfy me. She can't possibly give up enough of herself to fill up the hole that's in my heart. I can't love myself. Now, here's the thing. is I, This is super important. I have to say this. I can't love myself in a way that satisfies me. One is I know too much about myself. And when I hear people say, like my Facebook friend, I've just learned to love myself, I think, so are you lying to yourself? You remember the uh, Stuart Smalley, the Al Franken? Yeah. You know, SNL, you know, I, uh, I, I'm good enough, like, yeah. I'm smart enough, and people like me. I, can you learn to love yourself by looking at the mirror and saying, Aaron Miller, you're good enough and you're smart enough? I, I know myself. I know I'm not good enough. I know I'm a lousy bozo. Aaron Miller, you're smart enough. Oh my gosh! I, in my mind, are replaying all the dumb things I've well, done and Smalley said over this himself. past week. Stuart Smalley was a caricature of bad psychologists. Yeah, and the reason why is because there are bad psychologists who say things like, "You should tell yourself you're good enough and you're smart enough," and doggone it, people like you. It's nonsense. You can't lie to yourself enough to truly learn to love yourself. All of us, unless you're being honest, you have to say. Unless you're being dishonest, you have to say. I am not a completely lovable person, unless you're just completely lack self-awareness. So you're saying that if you want to get out of that hole where you really do have contempt for yourself, you really are unhappy with yourself, the way to do that, if I'm, if I'm following along here, is to admit that you're not very lovable. Well, Is that what you're saying? That's what I want people to see, not because I don't love them. But because 
It's the, you have to escape the prison. There's two prisons that I just described. The one is I need people to love me, to be happy. You know, I need a romantic relationship or I'm in a romantic relationship, but it's not fulfilling enough. Or I just wish I had more friends. I'm so lonely. Nobody likes me. That's one trap. Now, now it's, is romance good? Yes. Is friendship amazing? Yes, it totally can be, but it will never fill up the need for love that we have. The second trap is this, is I just have to learn to love myself. You can try and try and try. I'm just telling you, it's just going to make you hate yourself more. The more you deep dive on yourself to look for the things about you that are good enough and smart enough to doggone it, make people like you, you're going to realize it's empty. It's not there. So what are we going to do? If other people can't love me enough to make me happy, if I can't love myself to, to, enough to make me happy, you got to go back to that text you read from John 4. We can love because he first loved us. We God, can do it. We can do it because we can be filled up with the infinite amount of love that God has for us. Look, n- nobody else in the world is willing to, g- not even yourself, is willing to give yourself up to make yourself happy as much as Jesus is willing to give himself up to make you. My wife can't give herself up. She has to protect herself from my arrogance and from, from my narcissism and from my selfish. She has to protect herself. She has to constantly fight back against my desire to manipulate her love for me, which I all humans, it's built into us. Now, I'm, I'm trying to learn, and, and by God's help, I'm learning to love her selflessly more and more. But you describe people uh, you know, who do nice things for other people. But we're all the time, when we do nice things for other people, we're toting up ways that this benefits me or ways this puts them in debt to me. What we're doing is we're saying, I need to be desperately loved and I'm willing to do what I can to make people love me. But none of it will ever work until we go to the waterfall, until we go to the infinite source of love, Jesus who is the only person in the whole world, God's the only person in the whole world who loves us so much that he's willing to become just like us in order to die for us. And we will never, ever learn to love others. We will never, ever truly learn to love ourselves until we find that we're loved by God. And actually, when we say we love ourselves, what we mean is we're learning to see ourselves the way God sees us. I'll give you another example. And I I do think we've talked about this on a previous episode. I need to forgive myself. People will say, you can't forgive yourself. You know your own brokenness and your sin more than anybody does. But as Christians, we learn to live in God's forgiveness of us. God says, I completely forgive you 100%. I can't forgive myself. But then I have to say I have to sit there and decide which pill am I which pill am I going to take? Am I smarter than God? If God is powerful enough and loving enough to forgive me, who am I to say, "Oh well, no, he, God's wrong and I'm right. I'm actually guilty. I, I don't deserve love." If God looks at Aaron Miller and says, "I love him enough to become a human being to die for him," what right do I have to say I'm not worthy of love? I might feel like I'm not worthy of love. I might know when I look in the mirror, when I deep dive on my own psyche, that I'm not worthy of love. But when the eternal God of the universe says, I love you, I have to, at the end of the day, say, okay, you're right, I'm wrong. I am lovely because you say I'm lovely. And that's what I mean by learning to love myself. And that's why Jesus says, we love because he first loved us. So Jesus tells us, after getting a question from one of his hearers, he tells us that the great and first commandment is to, quote, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Then he says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So my question is, is this then a question of order? Loving God first, loving neighbor second, and loving self last. I don't. I think order is the wrong way to look at. I, I used to. I. Used to, I remember even when I was a kid, I would think it was funny. You know, you'd hear a football player interviewed after the game, and they'd say, "Man, it's just God first, and then family, and then football." And I would think, "What does that mean? Like God first? Does that mean like when you're playing football, you're actually sometimes you just stop and pray, or does it mean like sometimes, you know?" Does that mean your family is second place? How do you order that? You know, like when you play football, anybody who's played football or any kind of sport knows you're focused on the football, right? It's 100% in your mind. I've got a job to do. 
I'm a guard. I've got a pull on this play and sweep to the left side because we're doing a running play to the left side. You're not thinking about your mom. You're not praying prayers. Like you're playing football. It's not an order. It's 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 an organic relationship between the three. But you can't have you, you can't love God. You can't not love God and love yourself truly. You can't not love God and really love yourself. You can't not love your neighbor and really love yourself. You can't pull one of those things out of there. You can't truly love your neighbor without loving God. And if you truly love your neighbor, you love yourself. The three are, they're, they're, it's not an order. It's more like spokes on a wheel than it is like stairs. You can't take one of them out and the wheel survive. If you truly love God, you will truly love your neighbor and you will find that you truly love yourself. If you truly, if you try to love yourself without God and neighbor, it's going to be a wheel that don't go nowhere. If you try and love your neighbor without God, you're going to find yourself not really loving yourself. Again, the wheel's not going to go anywhere. You need all three spokes in that wheel that Jesus set up there. And who's more important, God or me? Obviously God. I'm not saying that it's not in terms of like uh, worthy of worship that they're the same. I'm saying in terms of like practical how I'm loving, you cannot live without the three of those all together. And God has designed us that way. God has designed us to be in community with others and with himself. So Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they were created for this, for worship and relationship with each other. It's only when they made themselves first that they screwed up their relationship with God and with each other. And that's all that Jesus is saying. So, you know, don't try and put them like, okay, I have to love God for 15 minutes and then others for 10 minutes, and then I can have five minutes of me time. It's not about that. It's about all three of those working together to be a truly full and complete human. So we have a listener who is in the deep, dark valley, who is intrigued by what you have said and is wrapping his or her mind around it and has maybe come to the conclusion that, yeah, you know, I've been sitting here on my you-know-what for a long time, just feeling sorry for myself yes. and, and feeling bad about myself. What if I tried to get up and go do something for somebody yes. else? What if I tried to I just did that in order to take this hyper focus that I have on myself all the time, yes. put my focus and energy into somebody else? What if I wanted to start doing that? Can that person do that without going to God first? In the context of all those things that you just said, maybe they can be really neighborly. But if what if they want to? But I don't want to do the. I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to be a Bible thumper. I just. I'm just going to go be nicer to people. Can they do it? Uh, sure, it's better than sitting inside in your room in the dark, crying and feeling sorry for yourself. And this is—I mean, this is piggybacking on something that we talked about in that in the um, depression episode that we did recently. Um, if somebody says to me, "I'm really struggling with like the the blues, really bad," or I'm like, "I I I've always people will say I've always like kind of grappled with depression, you know, kind of low level depression here and there, and it's really bad lately." My first question is, are you, what's your relationship with God like right now? Are you in community? If the answer is no to those things, that's the first thing I'm going to say. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say don't take medicine. Don't go see your doctor. Those things are important, but get outside of yourself, get into Christian community, get into worshiping God with other people. Now you had said, do they need to have God first or Christian community? Actually, God comes to us in Christian community. If people say, well, I don't, I don't really want to get out with other Christians or, or, or to be with, I, I don't want to be in community, I'll just kind of sit in my room and pray about it. I'll say, again, that's better than just feeling sorry for yourself. That's good. It's a nice start. But you've got to be in community because God meets us in Christian community. Again, you can't love God without loving neighbor. And if you're loving God and loving neighbor, you'll learn to love yourself. And you, and you can't separate those things. So I mean, go back and listen to the episode. There's other things that we talked about there and well, in that episode as well. But this is hugely key. Loving yourself is so tied to loving God and loving neighbor. And when I say loving God, I should say 
living in God's love for us, because that's what worship is about. Worship isn't about I'm giving to God. It's learning to live in what God is giving us. We love because he first loved us. So put yourself in a spot where you are experiencing God's love in Christian community. And I'm talking to non-Christians too now. This might be your portal to psychological and mental health and healing is finding Christian community that can truly genuinely be a conduit of this infinite love of God to you that can train you so that you can learn to love yourself. Well, it's our sincere hope and prayer that these conversations are edifying for you. Please let us know what you think about our podcast. Our webpage address is stjamesglencarbon.org. On the select page option, click contact us. Tell us how we're doing on Craving Answers, Craving God. For Pastor Aaron Miller, our production manager, Larry O'Leary, I'm Chuck Rathbun.